Let's talk herd. So I don't know what kind of question this this leads to, but does that make you think of anything that the horses have communicated with you about that energy world? Because they are just so in it. I mean, it's just their world. I just sometimes I don't know if they wonder why don't you understand, you know? <laughs> humans yeah humans <laughs> yep yeah, certainly certainly um some horses crave you know what we're talking about that energetic connection some horses um absolutely crave it from from people and yeah. and i think one of the things that, that that really sort of stands out for me is i've had people say to me um, you know, I saw this advert for a horse and I knew it was mine. You know, I just, you know, I've, I've seen sort of 20 adverts, but that that's my horse. And um, to the point that one lady um, put a, a deposit on the horse and, um, and said, don't sell it to anyone else. I'm going to pay you a deposit and, and, and I'm going to come and see her tomorrow um, because she was so certain that it was a horse and that, that horse saved her life uh, um, quite literally from an emotional point of view. And I think that, um, that that again shows us that other way that we connect. It's almost like it, it kind of goes beyond just sort of that natural um, affinity of personality where, where it comes into the energy resonance of actually recognizing souls as well so it's like you could have you know 10 beautiful horses that all perform beautifully wonderful manners and a kind but there's there's just that one horse that you completely resonate with yeah. um you know but i think we resonate with lots of horses over our lives but i think those ones that are the most similar to, to us tend to be the ones that we resonate the most with the ones that we often work best with and certainly i see frustration um in a lot of horses you know in the form of biting um, mm. and other undesirable behaviors because it's all you know you can almost hear them screaming just in the body language what you know what is it that you don't get you know that that they're saying to people because they're saying this is me I, I need acknowledgement recognize me for who I am leave your agenda leave your baggage at the gate and come to me as you are because when you come to me as you are then we can talk properly then we can talk energy then we can get to know each other yeah yeah that's such a powerful moment isn't it when just when you get into that present space with a horse and I've seen that with people where it feels like their horse and and them they just for they've seen each other for the first time and they might have been together for like 10 years but this moment they just they know each other and it it does it there are no words for that you know it's just yeah it's so emotional it is very 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 much so and i think that and i think it for some people it may be that it's just that snapshot in time that they may experience that it might just be for that few minutes um, and I think um, even if it's just for those few minutes, um, it, I think it's one of the biggest gifts that horses can offer us because it makes us aware that it's true. It makes us aware that it's in existence and that kind of puts us on that road to, to further seek it. I think that once they've allowed us to or rather enabled us to have that little glimpse of it, it's almost like you want more. You, you know, yeah. you go looking yeah. for more. Um, and it brings me to, I remember the same horse. Um, I had another experience with him that was that's fascinating. And, and, and I think it's a little bit like when you said about things being in the moment and spontaneous. I remember going out to, um, planning to ride, just go out sort of for a ride up the lanes. And I went out and he said, um, and he said, oh, we're not going riding today. 
he said, but get on, you know, hop on. I thought, oh, what are we doing? And um, when, when I got to the bottom of the drive, I, I went to ask him to turn left, as I always did, because um, that was a, a better route for us. It was a bit sort of more wide open, you know, if there was any traffic or anything about, although it was a country lane. But he was absolutely adamant we were talk- going right. There was obviously something that he had planned. Um, so I put the reins down. Um, and sort of held on to the front of the saddle. I didn't have my feet in the stirrups anyway, because I I tended not to ride with stirrups. I had those crossed over, so I was just sat in the saddle. And he took basically took me off for um, a self selection herbal hunt, is, is what we did. And he went out self medicating. We would wow, yeah, we, so we walked cool. down the the lane. Um, he would periodically stop. Sniff and start sniffing the air, turning around, sort of looking in different directions, sniffing the air again and walking off. He took me down various different tracks, finding different plants, luckily stopped um, sensibly when he got to a cattle grid. <laughs> um, he, and it was quite fascinating to be, to be able to watch him um, because he was, he was just wearing a head collar with reins at the time, so it was easy for him to be able to eat as well. And um, we came across sort of a, what almost looked like from a distance a, a dead shrub sort of bush. And when we got up closer, it had tiny, tiny little buds on it, not even a centimetre long. And it was just fascinating to watch how he sniffed the bush. And then he just started biting really gently, almost putting his lips back and nipping off the ends of all these little buds. Um, I did, I don't even know what the plant was, but he obviously knew what he was doing. And we were probably out for about three quarters of an hour. And he kind of lifted his head up and very deliberately marched me home again. Um, so, yeah, we only ever did that the once because he only asked to do it the once. But again, it was him offering a new um, experience, a new experience. And had I of been headstrong like, you know, so many of us are, um, you know, in the equestrian world, I might have said no and, and you know, and, and given him a wallop and said, no, we are going left <laughs> and totally missed out that experience. And so I think that's why when they offer us things and sometimes when they say no, it's not just because of pain, not just because they don't want to. Sometimes it's actually because they've got a better experience and learning in mind for us. And if we don't stop and listen to them, then, then we're going to miss all of those experiences. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and I, I, I tend to worry that I would say I worry more that I'm missing things. And but as you say, you have to remember that that it is if you're you know if you're relatively open, they do make it quite clear. You know, they make it quite easy. Not maybe not easy but it's not it's not difficult to listen once you've decided that you're you know you're open and you don't have an agenda you know they they will tell you i suppose i just kind of think well you know if they want to do that one day is it not like that every day and you know how much am i missing and and i think i think those are those are human concerns because whenever i get into their company it all becomes really sort of much more straightforward and you know you can just they're very easy to be with really horses they're very they're very in their bodies and they just know on the whole I think if they're if they're in a a situation where they're happy and balanced then they are quite they're just quite sort of good company and you don't have to worry too much about, you know, what, what, whether you're picking everything up because you just, you just feel it. They're good communicators on the whole, I would say. Do you notice a difference with horses and other animals? Um, Yes, yes, I work with um, all species, though probably somewhere between 70 and 90% of my work is horses. That's where my biggest passion is with with horses, Um, you know, because as as much as so many animals are abused, 
um, and, and poor training methods as well. I think as prey animals as well, I, and, and because they're big and a lot of people feel the need to dominate, that I feel that horses are, are some of the most misunderstood as well um, because as well but they're not invited into our home in the same way you know so many are stabled or, or living with companions out in the field and so our life tends to be a bit more mm. almost part-time with horses um for, for a lot of people because they're not living in our home as one of our family actually in our mm. home you know li living outside and so i think because of that once you take work out of the equation um, quite often a lot of horses, I think, miss out on, on that other time, what would be considered family time, social time. And it's really, really important that to sometimes put that work aside and to make sure that we have that quality time. It's, it's not so much about the quantity, so much as the quality of time, literally just hanging out with our friends, hanging out with our horses in the same way that we would our cats and dogs. It's not all about grooming our horses to make them look pretty and, and get the mud off. It's, it's about putting our hands on our horses and actually being able to feel them mm. when you do it. It's being able to make that tactile um, awareness touch of them that helps with connection in the same way, you know, mother and child connection. We talk about the bonding and how we connect with our, our horses. We see it with the mare and foal and how she licks her child, how she, you know, how the foal bumps up against her. It's, it, it's about that tactile, about that feel. Mm -hmm. And so if we're just riding, if we're just grooming, all of that real tactile connection um, is also them missing. It, it's a doing rather than a being. And we need to have that sort of relaxed state of mind and that tactile touch um, that can, even if there's almost like an air breath between the hand and the hair so that we're almost not even touching it, there's also, there still remains that energetic connection of that energy between your your body and their body is still making that connection yeah yeah there's something about the spontaneity that can be missing I think a lot of the time when you've got someone with a horse they have quite a a sort of strict schedule that they tend to adhere to and I don't know if that comes from the fact that it's a, a horse is a big animal and, you know, they feel like they have to stick to certain, you know, a, a routine to make sure that things stay, you know, as they should and that there's a lot of ways that things that could go wrong and that they're worried about that. But I have noticed that with, you know, a lot of, especially if somebody's got one or two horses, they're quite, it's very routine based. And they don't often allow for experiences like when you went out to find herbs with your horse, even down to what people will actually do when they're riding in the arena. You know, they'll do so many circles this way and so many that. And it's not so much about just being in what feels right now for today in this moment. And I, th I think I'm like very fortunate because I have the herd here at the house and and when I feel a little bit, you know, like work or what I'm doing on the computer is getting too sort of intense or too much, I'll just go out and I'll just be with them and just do exactly what you're saying. Just it might, it'll be just whatever I feel to do in that moment. It's not, you know, I don't really plan things out. And I think it, what you say is absolutely right. If people could just be a little bit less maybe indoctrinated about what they do, what they have to do, what, you know, I, I mean, I know that people have to sort of do the work that's required and, but just spend a bit more time just in that place where you could do anything, you know, where you're, but you don't have to do anything. Yeah, it definitely gives you a different perspective. 
And it's not just a perspective, it's also it changes your actual relationship because you become more more aligned. I think you just, even just spending time with them, I think your energies do align. And that's what I feel when I go out there to be with them. They are helping me to realign with with source energy and then become more coherent and just let go of any stress or and I, yeah, they are very powerful for that. Definitely. Um, yeah, certainly. I think if everybody could make a commitment to, to their horses of just even five minutes a day. I mean, some people are so pushed for time. They've got sort of like they finish work and they've got an hour. They've got to ride, brush their horse put the tack away, you know, and and get everything done and put their hay nets up or whatever it is that that, that they're doing. And, you know, quite Mm. often it's that pat on the neck and leave. Um, I think in those circumstances, you know, we all have busy lives, but, you know, if, if we could just find time, even if it's just that five minutes on that busy day, that five minutes makes a difference to the horse as to whether it feels acknowledged or not. Um, and that brings me to something that's really, really important, because if you were to say to me and or ask me the question, what is the most important thing um, to a horse? And, you know, obviously not every single individual, but it, as a broad spectrum, what is the most important thing to most horses? Um, in one word, it would be acknowledgement. And a lot of horses do not feel acknowledged. You know, so many people walk into the stable, walk straight past their horse, put put their food, you know, put their food bowl on the floor, put, you know, put their tack over on, you know, the saddle on the side of the fence. Don't take a moment to say hello to the horse before lifting it, waiting for the horse's reaction before you put the saddle on. Some people will just lift it straight up, straight onto the back. There's no looking to the dynamics of the horse, the behavior, the energy that the horse is giving off. It's almost like it's just, it's just not seen. It's it, all too often. It's just not seen. And when we actually stop and we break everything down into bite-sized chunks, and also when we breathe, because I think breathing has to be mentioned. It's such a massively, massively important thing. And when we just breathe, we stop and we observe. It's then that we start noticing all of these different things, the way that we are applying ourselves within what we are doing within with our horses at that time changes, it softens, the horse feels listened to, it changes the horse's responses, it helps the horse relax, and everything becomes more fluid, becomes more natural, more grounded. And, you know, it's almost like once the horse feels like it's being listened to as well, it's it's going to feel safe and listen to in a way that it feels that it can put across what it is that it needs to say, what it is that it needs you to know in the moment without being punished, without being ignored. And and it's then that that dialogue really starts to come to the front where you start to really start to understand each other. And a horse that doesn't feel listened to is a horse that starts to learn not to speak up anymore. And that's when we come across all of these horses that are so shut down because they have not been acknowledged and they have not been listened to. Mm. Yeah, I love I love that way of putting that because and I was going to say exactly that that I think maybe people have got into the habit or they just don't know or realize that horses have personalities that are are so, you know, are just as powerful as, as dogs and cats. But maybe if you think about it, that people start out their experience with horses, maybe in a riding school. So the horses are on, you know, on the whole, they're quite shut down and they're not really, they're quite dissociated just to cope with the experience. And, um, so people don't really know that what a horse can be like when they're 
really there and present. Yeah, so they just get into this habit of not seeing them. And then, you know, it's a vicious circle. It carries on like that. So they don't see the horse. So the horse doesn't feel seen. And it's just, yeah, I mean, it's a really good way of putting it. That it is all about acknowledgement. I notice that sometimes when people come to visit my horses, don't really like to call them my horses, but the horses I care for here, because they're so there, you know, they're so aware of people and so alive. And that's quite an experience for people who've only been around horses that just aren't really present. There is a big difference. And I think people can't really be blamed in a way for not realizing that because they haven't maybe ever experienced that. So yeah, it's a really important thing to to help. And I suppose the only way that someone can really discover that is either to start to realize like what you say that their horse does have that capacity you know and it's just how they are able to embrace them and bring that out or just having an experience with a horse who is awake but yes yeah it's a great way of of thinking about it I just want to ask you because I just because I happen to love cows do you speak to cows at all and what do you feel, what kind of communications have you had with them? Um, with regards to cows, not a huge amount um, because it tends to be, because a lot of the communication work is work that I'm asked to do. Um, it, quite yeah. often it's sort of animals that we, we consider as pets and, and horses. Um, but over 22 years, yes, I have communicated with cows. Cows are very different to horses um they're they're very very different obviously like horses you get the odd louder personality um and 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 again you know intellect you know is 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 a longer scale again like it is with horses like it is with people but with cows it tends to be much more of a oh i don't want to oh no i can't say that i was going to say they're almost more clone-like I almost don't want to use that word because it kind of takes away from suggesting that they've individual personalities um, and everything. But no, they I get do that. tend to not show, especially in a herd, not show so much individual personality, should we say, as horses do. Mm. Um, there is certainly much more of a flight instinct um, in horses, and you tend to find that when there is more of a prey instinct, um, there tends to be more intellect because it's more about staying alive. It's the adaption and, and, and the evolving in order to be able to stay alive, to being able to uh, problem solve. Mm as it were. So that there's certainly a difference between um, as, as a species, without a doubt. However, like you, I do love cows. I think they've got beautiful eyes. They've got beautiful, soft faces. And um, yeah, it's uh, so, so there is a difference from that point of view. And I suppose with a cow as well, their life tends to be quite different. You know, they may be dairy. They, can, they may well be pets, of course, as well. Mm. But because they don't tend to be in work so much as well, they're not also thinking as much, if that makes sense. And we have to remember as well that when we are working, when we are problem mm. solving, that's also how we make new connections in the brain. So by thinking, by exploring, by being creative, those those new connections are made. And so I suppose from a logical point of view, that could also possibly account for why there's a difference between the species as well, in the same way as a child that doesn't have interactions mm. in, in younger life um, or as many interactions as they need. Um, may be very different to a child that has had lots of interactions and experience. I'm not sure if I've explained that in a way that makes sense. But 
No, 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 it does. It, yeah, it makes me, it makes me think that in a way horses are evolving more because of their connection with us. But then maybe also we have disturbed more their kind of herd, their communal energy as a herd. And I feel like it's almost something that, that humans have been going through as well because we are less tribal and we're going more into a kind of individuation of, you know, each person is seeking their own personal vocation. And so it's almost like a natural evolution that happens. And it, maybe horses are just more or further down that, that road. Definitely. I mean, you know, lots of people were here, you know, here tell of, you know, our connections to the dolphins, to the whales, to the, to the messages that they have for us. Um, but obviously not all of us live in Florida or, or wherever it is that they are. Or, um, and not all of us can afford to or would even want to. I don't know. I certainly wouldn't want to go and see them in captivity. Um, to go and swim with them and, and to experience that. And one of the things that I found is that, that horses very much carry that same wisdom. It's almost like you mentioned the word tribal, but it's also sort of ancestral. It kind of goes back back further. To, to me, it, it might sound a bit of a strange way to put it, but it's almost like they carry the, the eons, they carry the time and the experiences and, and bloodlines, you know, and it's all flowing through their DNA. It's almost like they, they all bring it through with them. Mm. Um, almost like that accumulation um, and, and what is interesting is as a few horses and this is always funny enough I was talking to somebody about it just just last week there have been a few horses that I have communicated with that uh, were born into domestication had never lived in the wild um, but these horses, it's almost like this wildness, this needing to be free um, was still running through their veins. It wasn't that they were born in National Park. It wasn't that they were born, um, you know, of um, the new forest over, over in England and that they'd had that taste of freedom. These were literally born into full on domestication and yet there was still that innate part of them that understood freedom that understood domestication isn't for me I still yearn for the wild almost as if they were literally carrying it within their veins mm. yeah I, I do feel that quite often if we go into a really deep herd meditation and you know, sometimes there will be a sense of different of individuals coming forward and they don't, they actually feel like they're going into a, a different dimension also, almost in, in their abilities. So they, they're almost going beyond what they are as horses or as a herd. I really get that sense of what you're talking about, that they're, of the eons of the time and the way that they just, it's almost like they are some kind of capacitor or some kind of generator or some kind of, they, like that they are, um, they're holders. It's almost like they're keepers of that, of that wisdom. A little bit similar to crystals. I don't know if you've done any work with crystals, but they have that same sense of of wisdom and and being of it all encapsulated within but i would say i've experienced it more within the herd rather than individual horses would you say in your work from what you see that the herd is a very important for horses like it affects them a lot if they're not in a herd are we talking from a practical behavior point of view or are we talking about from a, um, a developmental, spiritual point of view? Um, both, I suppose. Whichever 
Yep, certainly from the point of view of as herd animals, um, having a herd, you know, for, for a horse to, to have companions, to be part of a herd and find its place within that herd is, is really, really important, not just from a safety point of view, you know, because of the lions in the bushes and things. It's, it's, all, it's all to do with as well, them understanding different personalities, working out the dynamics of and, and learning from each other, le working with the body language, working with who looks after who. So it's almost like, I suppose, instead of a herd, we could almost call them a community. Mm -hmm. And I tend to find that the, the, the horses that are understood, the horses that are acknowledged, that are given that life outside of work that is more natural, more to what, the horses were designed to, 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 to experience in life, I find that, that those horses tend to be, their energy tends to be a lot calmer. And, and you can really see it if a new herd member then comes in. It's almost like it, it doesn't disrupt because everybody's so comfortable in who they are that it makes it a lot easier for that new member to come and mm. slot in. Um, the other things as well, what I was saying earlier about, um, you know, sometimes people will see adverts or whatever and immediately know just from the photo that that's, that's the horse that they are meant to have or they go to a rescue, you know, to go and get a Shetland and come home with an ex-racer because that was the one that they were drawn to. Um, I think it's very much the same with horses as well. I remember when um, I was very ill about 10 years ago, um, one of my horses went to stay with, I could manage my two tiny ponies, but my horse went to stay with um, a friend of mine who had five Arabs. And um, the moment we walked in the yard, my horse was a really, really interesting boy and um, he was one of those that would sort of stand back and observe so he kind of went round and saying very quietly hello to, to all of the other horses on the yard um, and you know if his, if he had a face pulled at him he'd sort of stop still and wait ready to you know before he would act again and the whole time that this was going on there was a little black Arab that had come up to him was biting him all over um, to the point that my horse was then stood in the middle of the yard with these other horses he didn't know, with his back foot cocked, with a little black Arab hanging off of his lip, his top lip, by his teeth. Mm. And it was so obvious that this little horse was, was determined that this horse was going to be his friend. And it was, it was that, notice me, notice mm. me. Um, my horse stayed there for seven weeks, um, for seven weeks and the whole time they were absolutely just joined at the hip and my horse came home um, seven weeks later and I, fe I felt really guilty for, for splitting them up because the little black Arab was also bottom of the pecking order as well. Um, 18 months later I said to my friend I think my horse needs a you know I know he's got his little pony friends but I think he needs a he needs a horse his size. He always had lived previously I'd always had more horses um so he'd always had more friends before um i said can i you know, kind of have that little black arab to come and live with us and, and it was very obvious as well my friend said you do understand he's got learning issues i said yes i said it's very apparent he's he shows typical autistic symptoms um he's also you can see in his behavior and how he interacts with the herd you know there are other things going on with your you know your little black horse so anyway he came to live with us um and it was an absolutely fascinating to witness when he arrived because we pulled up with the trailer and my horse um was was out in the field and we unloaded manta the little black arab into the field and manta of course he hadn't he hadn't been to to, to our field before and he got out and he was trotting around the fields, completely ignoring Alfie's friend. And I'll never forget the look on Alfie's face where he was sort of following <laughs> around Manta mm. with this look of absolute disbelief on his face. And then he kept looking sideways wow. at me as if to say, is he really here? He just, like, he just couldn't believe that his friend was here. And mm. I think this shows the bonds that some of them have, you know, mm. mares that meet foals, 
um, that they were split up with 20 years ago and how sometimes these families and herds, even though they, some of them may never even have met, it's almost like they come together quite often, an acceptance of a family, um, whether related or not, and whether they've even met before or not, to come mm. together to share their lives. And it's so much commu more communal as well as to how we live. Um, it's almost like so much more accepting when you think about how you'll have a mare with um, her foal who may choose to share her milk with other foals and educate other foals if their own mother is, is you know, less interested and how they teach, you know, teach together. You know, we, we have almost like this... Um, home and family understanding of mum and dad and children and, and grandparents. And they kind of have the roles of parents, discipline, grandparents are meant to be that little bit more laid back, you know, and, and hand out the sweets. But And that tends to be how we see family for ourselves and how we put different roles in, into categories um, by generation um, and things. Whereas with horses, it's so, so different. It's so much more accepting and it tends to work more on the mm. individual's strengths um strengths and weaknesses and ability and natural authority mm. as to how they kind of form yeah. their family so that everybody has their role to play much more natural much more natural than the human relationships and everyday families that we're used to